Some of the most sought after IPAs are those displaying pungent tropical fruit characteristics. We're talking mango, guava, pineapple, and while modern hop varieties are known to contribute fruit notes to beer, a new product called Tropic Thunder is purported to enhance these tropical fruit characteristics. Just sprinkle some of it into the wort at the start of fermentation, but does this really result in a perceptible impact? To find out, I'm brewing a hazy IPA, splitting the batch and adding Tropic Thunder to only one of the fermenters. Then I'm serving the beer to participants and myself to see if tasters can discern a difference between the two beers. I do enjoy an IPA with ripe tropical fruit characteristics, so when I see brewing products that are said to amplify those flavours, I'm equal parts interested and sceptical. Can it really be as easy as just sprinkling a few grams of powder into the fermenter? Well, I've previously used another product purported to boost tropical aromas, and that's called Phantasm. That's a powder that unlocks thiol precursors bound in hops and malt, and those unlocked free thiols bring tropical and passion fruit aromas to beers. But Tropic Thunder from Cellar Science is a bit, is a bit different to that, and here's why. It produces tropical flavours by transforming certain compounds in the beer using a specific process called the Ehrlich pathway. Now, this is a series of biochemical reactions that convert certain compounds like amino acids into other flavourful compounds, essentially inducing yeast to produce tropical flavours. So for this experiment, I am brewing two hazy IPAs and I'm using a recipe kit provided to me by More Beer. This is the Heavenly Haze recipe kit. These are quite cool actually. They're hazy IPA kits and they're single hop kits. So there's one hop throughout all of this and I'm going for the New Zealand hop of Ruaka. Ruaka? I think I'm saying that right. So I've got all the bits that I need here. I've got bags of my base malt. This is just pale malt. Got specialty malts in here, my Ruaka hops and my yeast. And I've also got a thing that I'm going to be testing today, this Tropic Thunder. Now how this is going to work is I'm going to brew two batches. One batch I'm going to add Tropic Thunder into during fermentation, the other batch I'm not, and then we're going to see if we can tell the difference. But because this is a post-boil variable, I am going to just put all of this grain into a single vessel and mash from there. So let's get this stuff milled. The scale of everything today is quite ginormous. This is the 20 gallon Clawhammer brewing kettle. I've only used this once or twice before and one of the last times I was wearing a suit. So you're gonna add in my water salts into this. This is just reverse osmosis water. I've got calcium chloride gypsum and Epsom salt in here and about twice as much gypsum as the other two salts. I've also got quite a full bucket of grain here. This is just mind-blowingly big. I mean, let, let me show you. This, this is my normal size kettle. It looks so teeny. This needs to go in here. I'm gonna use a stool to give me a bit of height. I'll tell you about exactly what's in here in a sec, but I think this is something like 28 pounds of grain. Yeah, there we go. So given that this is a post-boil variable, I'm gonna add that Tropic Thunder once the beer is in one of the fermenters, it really didn't make sense to have two separate brewing systems and just have one big one. That way I can be sure that the work that I'm putting into the fermenters really is identical. It's all coming out of the same place. <laughs> all right, you know what? This actually isn't 28 pounds of grain. It's 20 pounds, it's just the base mall. <laughs> I didn't put the rest in. I didn't have to mill it, so I'd forgotten all about it. I should probably get that. Yeah, this does seem important. Probably do when I add it in. Have you ever heard that phrase, you forget your own head if it wasn't screwed on? I used to hear that a lot growing up. And we'll be mashing today for an hour, 152 Fahrenheit, 67 Celsius. And if I thought getting the grain into this thing was a hassle, it's still got to come out. Now this recipe kit was kindly provided by More Beer and is designed as a single hop hazy IPA kit. 
using only one hop should be a good way to isolate any impact that Tropic Thunder imparts in the beer. The 10 gallon recipe I'm using consists of 20 pounds of two row malt and two pounds each of white wheat, enzyme malt, flaked wheat and flaked oats. Mash rest is complete and I have a little bit of help to get this grain basket out of here. Up we go. Well, I've been boiling for 45 minutes already. Just letting it boil, there's been absolutely no uh, summarization of any alpha acids at this point. But with 15 minutes left, it's time to add in the hops. So I'm going to add in my rewacker pellets. Now I'm going to be adding in two of these bags. These are one ounce each or 28 grams each. So let's put these in now. And this is as close as I'm going to get to a bittery hop with this beer. This will contribute around 14 IBU to the beer. So two packets down, there's plenty more to go. Now I'm going to do a hop stand. So I've used my chiller to lower the temperature of the water to around 170 Fahrenheit or 77 Celsius. And now I'm going to add in another four ounces of hop. Now we're below the temperature of a summarization here, so we're not going to get much bitterness from this. We will get a little bit. Brewfather thinks we're going to get a few IBUs out of this, but mainly this is going to be here in order to get some of those aromas out of the hop, some of those essential oils. I'm just going to leave this hop stand like this for 30 minutes. I split the wort evenly between the fermenters and chilled down to around 69 Fahrenheit, so 21 Celsius. Time to add the yeast. This is what I'm using. So this is dry yeast from Cellar Science Hazy, it's called, and it says to add it just directly in. So I'm going to sprinkle this over the top of the wort. And finally, finally we get to the variable, something that's going to be different about these two beers. I have my Tropic Thunder to go into this batch over here. Now in terms of dosage rates, it recommends between 0.6 and 2 grams per gallon. And when I split this batch, I ended up with about 4 gallons in each. I kind of cut it off there so I could be sure it was an even amount. So I have here 8 grams of Tropic Thunder. And it says to add it at the start of fermentation. Uh, technically, fermentation hasn't started yet. I've just pitched the yeast now. But I am going to add this now anyway, because I do not want to open this up once fermentation starts. It's three days after brew day, which is now time for the first dry hop edition. Interestingly, there was a slight difference in when the bubbler on these fermenters started bubbling. And the one with Tropic Thunder started about an hour or so before the one without Tropic Thunder. Not sure what to make of that. But now in each one of these fermenters, I'm going to be adding my next hop addition. Two ounces or 56 grams are going into each fermenter. Now, perhaps a little surprisingly, but I'm still seeing airlock activity 10 days in. But now is when I'm going to add the remaining hops. So I have another two ounces to add to the dry hop. And these are intended to stay in for the last three days of fermentation. I think I'm going to cut this off around two weeks. So I'm going to add these in now, wait three days, then cold crash. And I'm going to add them through the bigger port this time. After cold crash, I pressure transferred to kegs where the beer was force carbonated. At that point, it was ready to serve to the ever willing members of the White Street Brewers Guild. How did they do? Well, a total of 21 people participated in this experiment. Each participant was served one sample of beer made with Tropic Thunder and two samples of the non-dosed beer in different colored cups and then asked to identify the unique sample. But before testing their palates, I figured I should first test my own with the help of my father who, yes, did indeed survive consuming my bathtub beer. So let's try the aroma first. Very aromatic. That would be my guess right now. Let's try them. I'm going to say the green is the odd one out. No, the blue is the odd one out. Blue is the odd one out. God, they're close. All right, let's try again. Round two. Okay, let's see if I got this now. All right, I think I got it. I think I've dialed it in. It's red. Yes. This finish is a little 
more bitter and this finish is a little bit sweeter or maybe I'm just a lucky guesser. So, round three. Thank you. Red is the other one out. It's blue. I'm gonna say red is the other one out. It's blue. Okay, I'm not even gonna taste them. I'm just gonna go for aroma, see if I'm on to something. I'm gonna say red is the other one out. Nope. It's blue. <laughs> Clearly, I cannot reliably distinguish these beers. A pitiful, pitiful result. Despite having brewed these beers and being fully aware of their differences, they were perceptively identical to me. Could the pros at more beer do better? Well, I sent Vito and Chris three marked cans and asked them to pick the odd beer out, which, spoiler alert, is the blue can. That is the batch that used Tropic Thunder. So what we're trying to do is isolate which one has the secret ingredient. Now, when I first went through, I'm like, oh, there it is. And then I go back through and I'm like, no, that one actually has a little less than what, what I was, thought. Was your first thought of, oh, there it is, the, the one that is different, was it red by chance? Or was no, it, it wasn't. No, no so, interesting. Because yeah, yeah. when I first smelled, I started here at green, worked my way to blue. And then when I smelled red, it was definitely a different more candy type aroma. And I think it's worth mentioning, like these type of products, um, you know, they're, they're not gonna turn it into a different type of beer. You know, it's a, a, you know, a symphony uh, has many players in it and you know, it's hard to isolate the cello out from the other ones, you know, so I, I would, you know, don't go into these expecting it to just turn it into, you know, a, a, a whole other beer. Um, it, it plays a part and it's, you know, the whole sum is greater because of those little contributions. The bright candy is similar in these two, so I am going to go on a limb. And when you're talking guava flavors, things green. like that, that, that it might be this green guy. Yeah, I'm going to stick with blue. That's mine. You're All going, right. where are you going? Green. Final green. There we go. Let's uh, pass it over to the Brewlosophy guys. But what about everybody else? Well, 12 tasters needed to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance. And only five did, indicating participants were unable to reliably distinguish a hazy IPA where Tropic Thunder was added at yeast pitch from one that was not. Not even close. So, so why didn't this work? Well, if we assume Cellar Science's claim about how this product works is true, it's possible that the, that the fruitiness from the hop additions in this beer just overshadowed any impact of the Tropic Thunder. Or maybe a different yeast strain might have fared better. I was excited to give this a try, but in this particular instance for this particular style, we have a non-significant result. But what about the bound file product I mentioned earlier? To find out how that fared, watch this video here. 